Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you. I'm look. Your Excellencies, the delegates. I'd like first of all to thank all of you for being here. And uh, I just observe that your very presence here is an indication of the close cooperation between the United Nations and African Union. So good morning to all of you, and thank you for being here. Africa once was dubbed the hopeless continent. Then suddenly it becomes the continent of hope. All the time, the narrative is from elsewhere. It is time for us now to seize the initiative and integrate and tell our own story the way we want it. So to begin with, let me bring you the fraternal greetings from the chairperson, who very much had wanted to be here, but problems in Somalia, South Sudan, have arrested his attention, and he's out there trying to get them sorted out properly before that becomes another narrative for the new commission. Africa's growth have, has always been linked to improvement in commodity prices. So when commodity prices fall, we fall with it. I think we need to break away from this. We need to add value, we need to process, we need to industrialize. But how do we do that? You cannot industrialize with a population which is illiterate and starving. So to be able to garner our forces and take advantage of the democratic, demographic dividends, our teaming youth, we need to be sure to have them educated. So the policy and the slogan of this new commission we discussed in the commission's meetings is going to be every African child in school before 2020. Every African child in school before 2020. It's not about education for the rich, technical education for some of us. It's everybody has to be educated, and this is possible. I have lived in the country and seen it done. I used to live in Cuba, and it was beautiful to see that in school time, there's no child on the streets. Every child is in the classroom, and they're giving breakfast and lunch, and they stay in school. They're able to produce 3,000 doctors every year. They've educated doctors and other people for us. I had uh, my uncle's son, who was a shoe shine boy. We got him into a program on the Isle of Youth. We took 800 Ghanaian students from between the ages of 12 and 14 to Cuba. They asked us, how do you want to name the school? Without asking anyone, I said, let's call the school Kwame Kuma Memorial Institute. Today, in Ghana today, out of these students, we have a neurosurgeon. My uncle's son, which I, who I took away, was going to be a Shushan boy. He's like a consultant pediatrician in the major hospital in Accra. This is what education can do for us. So I watched almost in tears when I saw on BBC TV two boys seeking to cross through the English Channel and have been stuck at the French side. Now, a truck ran one of them to the ground and killed him. So the journalist asked the, the other boy, the surviving boy, do you still want to go to Germany or England, and how do you propose to get there? And the boy's answer was, was both sad and fascinating. The boy said, listen, I crossed the Sahara Desert on foot. The English Channel is nothing. This shows you the determination of our boys for a better life. As Amiga Kara said, our people are not struggling for ideas in anybody's head. They simply want to see their lives go forward. And what we have to do as government, UN, AU, international organizations, is just to bring the total support to get these people achieve what they want. And this can be done 
at home in Africa, they don't have to go and struggle in Europe. We have to educate everybody, boys and girls. If you plan properly, you know those who are getting out of school, employment can be sorted out for them. They do not have to work in the spaces, the national spaces bestowed on us. We have to begin to understand how come our nations are the way they are. What is the origin of the African state? Last week, we had a, an AU border program in Accra. I would have liked to attend, but I was unable to. The issue of the African borders goes back to the time of the Berlin Conference of 1884-85. And that's the origin of the African nation state. These are not eternal categories. Our founding fathers of the AU had them as they were because they didn't want border problems to distract their attention. But our people must be able to move freely across. At the moment, as we sit here, try taking an articular truck of goods from Accra to Lome. You'll be amazed. It's even more difficult from Lome to Berlin and to Nigeria. The people who brought us those borders have removed theirs, but we are sticking to ours. Another issue which you've been talking about in Ghana, and this can be replicated in other places, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, about this issue of employment, we could have unemployed graduates from Cote d'Ivoire come to teach French in Ghana, for instance and vice versa for unemployed graduates in Ghana teach English and Côte d'Ivoire. They begin to know each other. They begin to find out they are the same people after all. I had the privilege of being secretary to President Mahama and we paid a bilateral visit to Côte d'Ivoire. Now, in our mind's eye, Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana appear to be two different countries. We got, got to Côte d'Ivoire and there was an array of chiefs in Kente come to meet the delegation. President Mahama thought, because of the Kente, that they were Ghanaian chiefs. They turned out to be Ivorian chiefs. I just met my brother Kaku here, the vice president of the ADB. Now, Kaku is a common name in Ghana. He's an Izuma boy. I like. <laughs> so, this English delegates, what I'm trying to say is that we need to govern ourselves and our people in a creative manner changing our curriculum to tell our story. We need, for instance, as African countries, to seek from our European partners the complete proceedings of the Berlin Conference of 1884-85. We need to understand how come Cote d'Ivoire became Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya became Kenya, and Uganda became Uganda. If we understand the source of our division, we can begin now to address them. So I'm focusing on just two things, education and a true rendition of our history. With that, we can begin to build on it and have a numerate and literate Africa. For the moment, we have no choice. We have to be literate in foreign languages. But with time, we can begin to articulate our own languages and develop a common language that we can all use. Swahili could be an example. <clears throat> so we need to be, begin to think outside the box. We need to educate all our people. We need to make sure their health is secured. They will take care of the rest. I think I'll stop here. I thank you for your attention.